offering a £20,000 reward for information that leads to his arrest. They also released images of the chef's uniform that he escaped in. Commander Dominic Murray, Murf, uh, Murphy rather, is head of the Met's Counter-Terrorism Command. He's urging Khalif to give himself up. My message to Daniel is to give himself up. We will be closing in on you. The public are motivated and trying to find you. Uh, we've had excellent support from the media. Um, it's only a matter of time before we find you, and I would appeal to you to call us and we will come and get you or go into your nearest police station and we, and, and, and we will detain you. Two Channel migrants who attacked police on a French beach have been jailed. 33-year-old Sali Tabe Abdullah and 25-year-old Ahmed Omar Saleh Qatar were sentenced to two years and two months for attempting to arrive in the UK illegally. The pair were part of a violent group who confronted officers near Calais as they tried to stop them launching a small boat. The Prime Minister says a free trade deal with India is not a given and not top of his agenda ahead of the G20 summit in Delhi. Rishi Sunak is expected to encourage India's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, to end his policy of neutrality to Russia. He'll also urge world leaders to address the war in Ukraine. He's refused to commit to having a trade agreement in place before the next election. Gun salutes have been fired in London to mark the first anniversary of the late Queen's death and the King's accession to the throne. They were held in Hyde Park and at the Tower of London with soldiers and horses who took part in the state funeral procession returning for those gun salutes in the King's honour. Charles and Camilla attended a private service of prayer this morning in the church near Balmoral where the late Queen worshipped. The King also recorded a special audio message in memory of his mother. In marking the first anniversary of Her Late Majesty's death and my accession, we recall with great affection her long life, devoted service and all she meant to so many of us. I am deeply grateful too for the love and support that has been shown to my wife and myself during this year as we do our utmost to be of service to you all. This is GB News across the UK on television, in your car, on digital radio and on your smart speaker by saying, play GB News. Now let's get straight back to Lawrence. At what juncture can an individual realistically assess that they are no longer living in a free society? At what point do humans cease their relentless march up and down the hills of life and say, here, I will die here, on this hill? Is it when our speech is restricted to such an extent that to express an opinion freely rather than parroting conformity will result in total social ostracisation and the loss of our livelihoods? Is it when we are demonised for upholding bodily autonomy in the face of salivating tin-pot totalitarians drippingly keen to force us into undergoing novel experimental medical procedures? Is it when our freedom to move is so prohibitively taxed and surveilled that we give up and say, I'm going to stay at home, staring at my screen like a good little comrade chewing on my ration of mealworms in soporific fealty? Is it when we send our children to schools where teachers have been replaced with political activists, not knowing whether our kid will return home having been socially transitioned by some vengeful ideologue? Or is it when the state decides whether a seriously ill yet fully conscious individual should be denied treatment and left to die to protect our NHS? Which hill will you die on? Well, an NHS hospital is asking the Court of Protection to remove life-saving treatment from a fully conscious 19-year-old girl suffering from a similar condition to Charlie Gard because she is actively dying. The girl, known only as ST, understandably would like to prioritise her right to life over the budget sheets of our beloved NHS and has been assessed by two separate psychiatrists to be of sound mind. She wants to raise money to partake in clinical trials overseas, which she is aware may not work. She says she wants to die trying to live. The doctors in our beloved health service view this strange refusal just to give up and die so they can clear up some bed space as a refusal to accept the inevitable and therefore signs of delusion. So they took their disagreement to court. 
Whew, thank God for the courts, I hear you say. Yes, the education system has been infiltrated by the child mutilation cult, along with the police force and all the other national institutions, which bang the diversity drum as their buildings burn down around them. But the courts, the slow, cold dissection of facts and evidence, are blind to the ideological leanings of any individuals concerned, and, we, and will, we are led to believe, eventually get it right in the end. We can trust the courts. Impartial apolitical, fair. So, surely the judge, Mrs Justice Roberts, would see sense and grant this girl the right to live, a freedom she should never have to ask for. No. Rejecting the opinion of both psychiatric experts, the judge concluded that ST, as she is known, is mentally incapable of making decisions for herself because she does not believe what the doctors say about her condition. She concluded, in my judgment, ST is unable to make a decision for herself in relation to her future medical treatment, including the proposed move to palliative care because she does not believe the information she has been given by her doctors. Not only has the esteemed judge reached her hand into a young life and desperate family to remove the ultimate freedom, that of life, like so many of the pernicious dealings of the courts these days, she has imposed the strictest of reporting restrictions, denying the family the right to speak publicly about the case and raise money for ST to go to Canada for that last chance at experimental life-saving treatment. Putting aside the, in my view, satanic insanity of Justice Roberts's judgment, the silencing of the family's freedom of speech to speak about the case is an even starker wrong. To be gagged whilst you are dying seems just so infinitely cruel. The right to life is the only unqualified right in the European Convention on Human Rights. Why would a judge impose such draconian restrictions to free speech on such a vulnerable human being? And for whose benefit would she do so? This is a crucial debate. A debate to be heard in public and on television, reported in newspapers, argued around dinner tables and propped up against the bar, not behind closed doors. Discussions like, what is the cost of human life? What is the cost of human life to our beloved NHS? Is premeditatedly denying someone the right to life not a form of murder in itself? Who knows? But the decision to silence the girl and her family means there will be no discussion or debate, no sunlight to disinfect this egregious wrong. As ST continues to die while desperately trying to live. It would seem that those who wish to insert new orthodoxies into the system learned their lesson from Charlie Gard. There will be no tearful parents on TV sofas. There will be no innocent children's faces on newspaper pages. One wonders how many more horrors lurk behind the justice system's inability to silence free speech and silence the voices of parents in society wishing to replace the family with their own warm and fatal embrace. Certainly the politicians have shown no interest in protecting this most ancient and sacred of institutions, the family. Their preening ambition prevents them from even having schools inform parents of life-altering decisions made by immature, impressionable children. This conservative in name only party are the most gutless bunch of cowards to ever represent us, our values and our traditions. Absolutely and utterly captured, like their chums on the other side of the house by the child mutilation cult and its equally sinister derivatives. This is why the decision of ST is so worrying. The last appeal to authority a human being can make is to those who have been chosen to judge. Judgments of this importance should be open and transparent, not silenced and sucked down into the darkness. So I said at the beginning, at what juncture can an individual realistically assess that they no longer live in a free society? I would say, when the state removes a human being's right to life, not only are you about as far away from a free society as you can get, you are somewhere much, much worse. So, tonight I'm going to ask you, should the state get out of our way? Email gbviews at gbnews.com or tweet gbnews or at Lots of Fox. Also, uh, yeah, quickly, Van, my overlords at the GB News HQ are introducing a new concept called the balance horn. It sounds like this. That's what they tell me that I, that's when they tell me that I've gone too far 
without shouting my ear because I pull my ear thing out. Anyway, let's hear it one more time. What could possibly go wrong? Right, as I mentioned already, a critically ill 19-year-old girl and her family are fighting the NHS in court over plans to stop her treatment and proceed with end-of-life care. As anonymised by the court, ST has said, I want to die trying to live. We have to try everything. So, to discuss this problematic case is the director of the Anscombe Bioethics Centre, Professor David Jones. David, good evening. Why good evening. is uh, this case being hidden behind, um, you know, the, these restrictions on talking about it? Well, I'm afraid that's the norm. I'm a, you will see this in relation to the Charlie Gard case. The Court of Protection routinely prevents um, uh, parents from, from speaking about their, 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 their child, ostensibly for the good of the child, because uh, exposure to publicity can be detrimental. But in, in fact, um, uh, I, I do wonder if, who the Court of Protection protects, really, because it, it doesn't uh, protect the rights of parents to allow the, the public to understand. But this is very, very common. This is very common. Some people might say that uh, this, is, uh, this tragic story of a young woman dying is, um, is already concluded in one way. And that, you know, they're, they're taxpayers and they would like this money to be invested on someone who has still had a life ahead of them. What would you say to those people? Well, I, it's not simply the question of should she get treatment or not and should she get treatment on the NHS or not. The first question, fundamentally the first question is can we hear her voice? That's the first question. And is the fact that you disagree with your doctors sufficient to say that you lack mental capacity because because this is a very worrying case in this respect it's a very worrying case in the in, in not reporting it is quite common but in saying because you disagree with your doctors therefore you, you actually don't have capacity even to disagree that this is something new and something very worrying can you explain why the judge has come to her judgment do you think so the, uh, the, the trust um, think that the, um, uh, the young woman in question is wrong and um, they've tried to persuade uh, uh, this, this, this young woman to, to think about what would be the options if things didn't work out. And she doesn't want to talk about that. She wants to talk hopefully about things. And um, so they've been frustrated in this, this way. She's somebody who's quite determined and her family are quite determined to, to, to do as much as they can to, um, um, to give us the, the small chance, and I think honestly it is a small chance, but to give that small chance that, that um, something might help her. And uh, because they've been so frustrated, they've gone to the court and they've said to the court, we can't talk sense to this girl, um, and therefore we want you to say that uh, she hasn't got capacity, so we can then bypass her and then uh, make a, a best interest decision on her, on her behalf. So I made a point in my monologue about the fact that if you are making a premeditated decision to deny someone the right to life, that is in its own way some form of murder. Would that be too strong for you? No, I think I, I, it would be too strong because um, <laughs> lots of people want things from their doctors in the hope that they might help, and uh, and the doctors honestly don't think it will help, and doctors are not obliged to give what they don't think will help, um, and 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 that that might be there that might that's part of the situation here. They honestly don't think it will help. She 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 wants something. The fundamental problem here is it's all, as you say, in secret. 
It's all, uh, it's all hidden. She can't go public about this. She can't decide that she wants to have private, I mean, this is the, the great heresy in this country, she can't have private medical treatment if the NHS decides they don't want to fund this. It's the NHS that don't want to fund this. That's a, that is a decision that we might want to make. Well, the NHS have actually, sorry to interrupt you, the, the NHS Trust have said, because of the balance horn, the NHS Trust has said, our focus remains on providing the very best of care and support to the patient, their family and the clinical teams in these very distressing circumstances. Um, is the very best of care to uh, kill someone? So, sometimes, often, there's little that medicine can do and sometimes trying to do something when, when there's not much you can do left will do more harm than good. Doctors sometimes do more harm than good. So I think that doctors sometimes they want to step back and they want to say, we, we think we've, 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 we've done enough uh, here. We can't, we can't do anything more. Uh, the, the, the problem here is honesty and transparency. And the, the voice of the person who is most affected has actually been taken away in order for the doctors to have more of an easy ride in saying, well, that, sorry, I should, in order for the doctors you're to allowed, be you're able to... to uh, offer a view, I can challenge it. it, it you say exactly what you think. If you think, it, if you think I, the truth I, I, being denied I, I, a voice I, to protect the doctors, you say what you think, and I'll challenge you. Well, I, I think it's, it's easier for a doctor to say, we think it is in your best interest to uh, not have treatment, and uh, you're not competent to say so otherwise than to say, we know you want treatment, but we're not going to give it to you. Where is, the balance? Where is, the, where is the balance between, uh, uh, you know, a, a taxpayer-funded health service that needs to look after the needs of, of patients across the community and the rights of someone to, to extend their life? I mean, is there, is there a debate to be had? Or, or, in my view, you can't... You have the right to life. It's Article 2, isn't it? So you have the right to life. But, I mean, if, if, where is the balance? You, you have the right to life, but you don't have the rights to every most expensive treatment, which probably won't work in your case and might work for somebody else. So the, there are very difficult decisions to be made about allocation, and people often duck those decisions. But the key thing is transparency and allowing things to happen in public and allowing people to have their voice, and most of all, not saying, because a young woman disagrees with her doctor, we can say she's not competent anymore. I mean, this is this is the woman in white. This is this is saying you have got someone who we don't like what you're saying. So we will say we will um, take away your right to speak, take away your right to be to be to be active. That's what I find sinister. In all. Which to me, uh, you know, as much as I'm trying to be balanced because I've got to be, uh, is is possibly the deepest cruelty you could ever commit on another human being. I, mean, I think that the, the, the fact is, she's a very, very poorly. She's really, really sick. It's unlikely that she'll get through this. And whatever she does, e even if she won her case and uh, the judge had made a different decision, they'd done everything they could. She got onto this um, uh, Canadian or a couple in the States, I think, um, uh, experimental trial. Likelihood is it's not going to work. That's the most likely outcome. But she wants to die trying. That's what she and that, wants. And, that, and that, is, that is the fundamental part of the right to life. David, thank you so much. I've got to move on. Thank you. You are watching and listening to GB News. Still to come, I'll be talking to Health and Social Affairs editor at The Express, Lucy Johnston, to unpick whether we are over-diagnosing and over-medicating our children. Don't miss that one. The temperature's rising. Boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. For most of us, the hot spell continues this weekend, but with an increasing chance of seeing some big thunderstorms. And eventually it will turn cooler into next week as this cold front approaches. But for the time being, we're between high pressure and low pressure and we still have the hot air in place, a balmy evening out there. One or two very isolated thundery showers across parts of the west, but the vast majority staying dry. We'll turn a little murky in places, a bit misty, particularly around the coasts uh, through the west. And it's going to be a very warm night as well. Temperatures holding up in towns and cities in the mid to high teens. Some spots may not 
not drop below 20 Celsius. So a very warm start to what will be a hot Saturday. The main exception will be the far northwest where it will be distinctly cooler than today. And as the day goes on, there is an increasing chance of seeing some thunderstorms breaking out across the hearts of the country. Now, if we see these downpours, they could cause some problems. There is a Met Office warning in place, but they're going to be very hit and miss. Most places won't see them. Temperatures again getting into the 30s, but as I said, quite a bit cooler across the northwest of Scotland, where there will be more cloud and outbreaks of rain. Still a few thunderstorms rumbling on through the night and into Sunday, a greater chance of seeing more of these downpours. Parts of northern England, north Wales, maybe into southern Scotland with a chance of thunderstorms, but even further south we could import some from France. Again, the majority won't see them, and again, for most, another hot one. The temperature's rising. Boxed Solar, proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that, if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you, and we want you to get to know us. From 6, it's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. When the news happens, it happens here. And really important breaking news. Breaking news this morning. On TV, radio and online, the news starts here on Britain's Newsroom. All the biggest stories and the answers that you need from across the UK and beyond. Join Britain's Newsroom from 9.30 on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. People in Britain, they love free speech, but they also love fair play. I don't care if I'm speaking somebody from a trade union, from the Labour Party, somebody from the SNP. And I think the viewers like to see that actually we can challenge one another, but in a positive way. We think we ask the questions that people want to ask, and often we ask the questions that we wanted to ask in Parliament, but never got the chance to ask. So join us every Saturday, 10 a.m. till noon on GB News. Britain's news channel. It's all about family, being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Welcome back. You are watching and listening to GB News with me, Lawrence Fox. Joining me now is Lucy Johnston, Health and Social Affairs Editor at The Express. Lucy, thanks for coming in. Are we over-diagnosing and over-medicalising our kids and turning them into sort of paranoid wrecks? What's happening? Well, there has been a huge increase in the numbers of children who are getting diagnoses. And it wasn't really seen before the sort of 90s and 80s. It's a big business and it's worth a lot of money. I think we spend about over a billion pounds a year on drugs to treat wow. children. But of course, all these uh, so-called neurodiversities are different. They include dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, uh, functions of the brain where people struggle and they're not 
uh, medicalized yet and not drugged. But there are other conditions. Such ADD, as ADHD, those sorts of things. Those sorts the of things where there, yeah, where there are drugs that are used. And those drugs are uh, a derivative of amphetamines. They're stimulant drugs. And they confession, are... I've got a confession. Go ahead. Um, a friend of mine who... Well, he's an ex-friend of mine, actually, now that I've started saying what I think. Um, you made a huge amount of money. And his way of making staying awake while he made some money was to, to, to bosh up a Ritalin into two lines and snort it like cocaine. But how does he make money? No, no, he he's, he's never goes to sleep. Oh, I see. Anyway, I, see. I did this with him once. Oh, OK. Ritalin is some seriously strong stuff, I can it, tell you that. Yes, Schedule 2, I think. Yeah, it is. So they're really... derivatives of amphetamines, yeah, yeah, that's it. So it's like speed. Yeah. And uh, the studies that show it works, and I think it does, and anecdotally it, it helps, works in inverted commas, helps children concentrate. But also um, there are... So that that I think parents... And teachers get quite addicted to the fact that children are suddenly behaving, they're meeting their milestones that they want to meet want them to meet. But the the most of the studies on these have been done uh, by industry, making money out of it, and they're only short term. They last sort of six to twelve weeks. And what's really depressing about it is that there are longer term studies out there, but they don't seem to get a blink of attention anyway. What do the longer-term studies say? And the longer-term studies, and these include something called the Cochrane View, which is a review of reviews, and it's unbiased, it's independent, and um, there's another three-year follow-up study on children, and they show that there's no better outcomes for these children that are on these drugs. There's, they're either worse or, 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 or the same, and they've looked at a range of mental health kind of criteria and also quality of life and also um, looking at their life chances and their chance of getting jobs. So those studies show that they're, they're, they, there aren't improvements. And symptomatic relief is what they're... Symptomatic relief is what we're doing. But the, the issue is we're giving drugs to children that do have side effects. So there are short-term side effects like headaches and insomnia and weight loss. They uh, increase the sort of... Um, blood pressure and the heart rate and the the long-term studies show that the children on these drugs can be shorter they can be um, also have lighter they're, they're less heavy they can have there is a great risk of becoming tolerant because these drugs are addictive then you need more to have the same effect and some people can be on them for life and there's also uh, an increased risk if you're doing this to your heart and your uh, cardiovascular system there's a risk of heart disease i don't know how big it is but there is that risk and even some suggestion uh, of a risk of Parkinson's because you're messing with the neurotransmitters in the brain and dopamine signals. But is, so there is, is, is it... a danger to these drugs. So if we're not doing anything for these children long term, but we're just controlling a set of collection of symptoms in the short term, then would we want to question how we treat them? And would patients, time, support, that sort of behavioural therapy, would that not be something which we could do for some of these children? Do you think it's do you think it's because uh, overwhelmingly as a society we like to pathologize things and we like to turn around and go you have x problem and it can be treated the symptoms of it can be treated with y drug or is it because we're actually to to make their argument the sort of you know the other side's argument it's like you haven't seen this this overwhelming number of kids who are really struggling and they need this medical um uh, they need cocaine to survive I don't so. see good evidence that these collection of symptoms... No-one's actually shown in a laboratory or anywhere that these collection of symptoms are caused by this particular thing in the brain. So we don't know that this is some wiring or DNA. There's lots of theories about it. So... But the, uh, there is a big, big industry around it and there's a lot of money made from it and there's a big market in it. And the danger is when there's a lot of money being made by something and a big market in some, something and industry-sponsored trials in something, there is a danger of bias, which is why I wanted to discuss tonight the independent trials that show no long-term difference or even worse outcomes for those children who have been treated with these drugs. So I think uh, the um, labelling uh, and pathologising of children is...
being turbocharged by social media, isn't it? I read today, I think there's hashtag ADHD, one of the neurodiverse conditions, yeah. has been viewed 19 billion times or something. You know, so people are picking up on it and it's being but the social media is, is pushing it. And I think a lot of people, celebrities and influencers are also coming out now and saying that they uh, think that, or they have been diagnosed with it. So it's becoming sort of trendy as well. Yeah. And um, there are private practitioners who for a fee will give you a diagnosis and give you the drugs. I don't think you get much on the NHS. It takes a long time, you have to wait. But um, it's not... Because that's the industry it. around it, isn't it? So you've got the billion pounds a year for, for the drugs themselves, and then you've got all of the, the, the people that circle, the vultures that circle the, the patient. Practitioners. To go. That's not to say that every single child with a diagnosis and with... Uh, a drug, you know, should not have it. It's Could they just benefit? One... W would it be a combi... So if you're saying, look, six to 12 weeks, it could really help a child. Should we say these things are great ideas? You've got a really tough term coming up and you've got your GCSEs and you're all over the shop and you're just, you can't concentrate. Why not give them six, 12 weeks worth of speed to get through the, um, the exams and focus all the time? The problem with that is that you're not teaching children life skills. Life's tough, Coping. exams are tough, it's tough out there. And if you're drugging and pathologizing children, then what are we actually teaching them? And the danger is that once you take that drug, it is very dependent forming. But children do become tolerant on it. And when they come off, they can suffer chills and side effects and it's not nice. So there is a danger to that. And if one was to, you know, have the resources to put in support and to try and teach children, you know, in a different way and, and improve their behaviours in a different way, that might be better and less risky for them. I sort of, it, that, the, my mum was a nurse and she always used to say you treat you the whole person. You, you, and, you know, she would, she, she would avoid as much as she could going, you know, to have some drugs for this, have some drugs for that. Having said that, I do love a sulfidine max myself. <laughs> but, um, my she... mum's a nurse as well, so we have share that in common and she would be the same. Yeah, yeah she would be like, what, what's the problem? And, yeah. you know, if you've, got a, if you've got... I mean, I don't really understand any of these diagnoses. I just think, essentially, all the, a, the ones that begin with A, all those acronyms, I just think that's just boys. Mainly. I mean, I'm being a bit short-termist about it, but I'm just like, that's what kids are like. Well, increasing number of girls, for girls, apparently. But uh, I'll see, I've, uh, I can't remember who said this, but I think it's a famous trope. You know, schools are designed for girls. Girls are more organised, they're tidy, they like doing things. Boys, they just want to run around and bang their heads into walls. Is well, that, I, is there I don't know. I'm not sure I'm tidy and, and want to sit down and organise. I'm not, not any of those things, but there is that. And I think schools inherently are not um, set up for... Uh, really children to have the best welfare. We don't, uh, the whole structure of them is to sit, sit down, sit for a double lesson, sit for another du double lesson, and then you squeeze in some games. It doesn't, I never think that's very natural, and I don't think... What would you um, do? Well, I mean, there are other sort of approaches, aren't there? There are forest schools and children out, outdoor learning. You might change the whole system. The system's sort of set up, really. It still kind of has echoes of the Victorian era where people had to rote learn things and keep rote learning things. We now have the internet, we have Google. I know it's got its biases and problems, but so do, so do many things. Perhaps we need to relook at the whole education system. We don't need to re rote learn things anymore. Yeah. We have. Uh, we have ways of getting information very quickly and perhaps we need to think about more creative learning and more physical uh, aspects yeah. to education because it, um, it, 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 it can't be natural to sit all day. It's not good for us, it's not good yeah. for anyone. And then to dope people into concentration. Well, Lucy Johnston, thank you very much. You are watching and listening to GB News. Coming up, it's time for Fox and the News Hounds. And guess who's here? Narinda. She's going to tell us how much she loves the Queen. Loved the Queen. See you in three. The Live Desk with me, Mark Longhurst. And me, Pip Thompson. It's here Monday to Friday on GB News. From midday, we'll bring you the news as it breaks, whenever it's happening and wherever it's happening. From across the UK, 
and around the world. Refreshing, feisty, but with a bit of fun too. If it matters to you, we'll have it covered on TV, radio and online. Join the live desk on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm. Join me, Dan Wooten, for two hours packed full of unfiltered opinions, unique takes and fiery debates. I guarantee you blockbuster guests and exclusive reporting with no spin, no bias, no censorship. I think there is a culture of collusion, quite frankly. And no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm, only on GB News, Britain's news channel. In a world of dull and predictable radio and TV shows. Oh, hi. On Mark Dolan tonight, we've got big guests. We drill into the big stories of the day. <laughs> the show adds up to a brilliant listening and viewing experience. Mark Dolan tonight is the most entertaining current affairs show ever. And that's a fact. That's Mark Dolan tonight, Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 9. Only on GB News. Britain's news channel like all families we have arguments every now and then but actually we agree on what the mission of GB News is and that's the most fundamentally important thing. GB News provides the kind of platform that lets all voices be heard. We don't hold back, we're free to say what we really think. Just because some people who live in a tiny little Westminster bubble think that their particular story is important, that's not the most important story for me. And often they will be difficult stories, stories that you won't find on the establishment media. Because what people think in the north of England may be very different to what they're thinking in the home counties. We're going to carry on telling the world what life is really like for households up and down the UK. We love to be in your car, in your kitchen as you're having your breakfast. Whatever you're doing, you are part of the show. If it matters to you, it matters to us. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Um, right, I, here are some reactions to my question, should the state get out of the way? The people are the state. It's a shrinking in government that is needed, says G. I completely agree with you. The state should be restricted to 40% of the... I mean, that's even way too much, anyway. Wendy says, it's heartbreaking. The human instinct is to strive forward in life. How dare someone who has no emotional involvement decide otherwise? Well put. Phil says, the NHS rationale appears to be that ST is going to die anyway, so let's accelerate her fate and get, over with, get it over with. That logic could equally apply to every one of us. It's simply a matter of scale. OK, so I think everyone's on board with the idea of it's appalling what is being done to ST under the cloak of silence and anonymity against all of the things to do that with free speech, which makes, separates us from totalitarianism. Anyway, in the studio is my panel, political commentator Reem Ibrahim. Hello. And broadcaster Narinda Kaur. Hi. <laughs> Right. I have to say, Reem was really loud in the green room. Can I? It was I mean, you do this. Stop now. <laughs> OK. A year ago today, our beloved Queen sadly passed away. Yeah, someone said, why did everyone say passed away? She died. King Charles marked the anniversary with a, with a prayer service near Balmoral. Um, how do you think Charles has compared so far? But actually, before we go there, N Narinda... How do you feel a year on? I just wish you hadn't asked me because it's going to take me down this terrible, terrible journey with being trolled. Um, I, I don't. I think Charles could do better um, than his mum did. And I think his mum left him in a bit of a mess. You said a seven-year-old could do better. Yes, yeah, I do. I don't think the Queen. I think I the Queen. Even the you Queen. On and it's the there. Queen oh failed as a monarch. Um, she. What? She failed as a monarch. I'm sorry to say that because I think I think that she was this figurehead of colonialism. People saw her as that, oh, and she never apologised 
ever apologise. And, you know, people have resentment for towards that. People from the former colonies and even uh, in the Caribbean, they weren't sad when she died. The horn, please, the horn. They didn't, they were not sad. Some people celebrated because she did not apologise for the wrongs that this country did. So I think Charles, actually, to give me, give me just this last sentence, Charles can do better, and I hope he does. And I think he, I hope he does apologise for the wrongs committed in the past. Oh, oh my God, I tell you what, <laughs> the technical team, we I'd just it. like to take a moment to, to just, I'm going to take a 10 minute pause to thank the, the technical team. <laughs> Thanks, um, Reem, team. Reem, um, obviously you hate the Queen, you hate England, you hate the monarchy, I you mean, hate every clearly. institution we've done. Why do you hate us so much? I, I you know what? I, I think that with pe you know, people like Narinda who sort of emphasise the colonial history that this country has, we've got to think about the differences here. The Queen was not out there taking over different countries herself. The British Empire and empires across the world had existed. It's kind of the, you know the entire precedent behind world history. Um, you know what I will say is I think the Queen was an honourable individual who served this country incredibly well, and I think it's I think it's actually quite offensive to sort of talk about the Queen in this way. Prince Charles, uh, King Charles, sorry, when he was the prince, involved himself too much in politics. He... I think the monarchy should involve no, themselves. Because was what difference about did the, the Queen? Environment, about good, net zero, good. About all you know, the monarchy should not be political. So the Queen you know what the Queen was remembered for? Paddington Bear. What did she establish? What did she do in her life? Did she help the poor in this true. country? Did she help anyone in this country? Is that her job? What then what are we paying for? We, are we not pay for them. We do not... So, actually, th th this is quite a misconception. No, that's the is right that, conception. So, with the Crown Estate, the Crown Estate's finances go straight to the Treasury. Oh. So, the, actually, the, the, the royal family costs the state less than we pay Oh, that's, for that's such a weak argument, and that's not actually... No, 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 not anything nice. But you know what, I, I did... See, we can get the horn in I did like... like you know, I used to oh. like the royal family. Oh, my God, I got so good. They were like... Right. I no, like the royal... Nirinda, let's play, let's play an exercise. OK. You got anything nice to say about the monarchy? I, I'm hoping Prince William will put everything right because I think the younger generation are looking at Prince will William. You, will they forgive? Him? So at what, I think if at he apologises, the colonised forgive the colonisers. The and minute if you use the rhetoric that you're using. I, wait, hang on, I'm talking. If you use the rhetoric of the coloniser, what do you, what would you say to the people in England who go, we're being colonised by all these immigrants? They're colonising us. They're not colonising you, though. But that's, that's what. That's, what, what, that's, what would you say to people dumb. who said that? That's absolutely dumb. That's just a stupid thing. They're not colonising. There's no invasion. So you can How, see the positive. You can see the positive of us having a bunch of every single day, 800 people, military age men, arriving without their wives and children. You, I think our economy positive. needs it. I think our economy needs the uh, workers. Okay. But you it can't needs the see workers. the positives. Of no, no, you need shush. I know um, it's. A, I'm not so, even in charge. So is it the yeah, first time this is this yes. time? I love this because like, <laughs> we can go all get a word in. Narinda, I think that what you're doing here is you're using these terms like colonisation and these sort of incredibly emotive terms to try and make it sound it's like. Fact. Ooh, like try and make it sound like the royal family had actually anything to do with. They this did. Talk. No, they didn't. Reem, you cannot sit they there. Didn't. That is very ignorant and very innocent of you, naive of you to say. Oh, oh they had God, nothing to do with it. The Queen. The Queen. No, I know. I can't believe you're 21. The Queen knew everything. <laughs> she didn't apologise ah, for the John Massacre. And actually, can I just down. say, William is a terrible brother to Harry as well. Oh, Harry's Wild. a legend. Right. I love Harry. I'm so... I know you do. Yes. Well, of course. Are you sweating? Oh, sorry, but I am now. <laughs> right, listen. Britain's most wanted man has been spotted. Oh, Daniel. he has! Can I finish the auto cue? <laughs> You've sorry. got to stop! <laughs> He's been spotted. Daniel Khalif, the escaped terror suspect, was reportedly seen walking away from the bid food van near the Wandsworth roundabout. Oh. Mm, I like the McDonald's drive through over there. The Met is offering a reward of up to £20,000 for information that directly leads to his arrest. Now, I want to know from both of you, who would you hand in for 20000 quid, Narinda? N not a family member, because this I think that's terrible. You, you what should... did you just say outside? What did I say? You know. Oh, about my husband. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would hand him my husband for free. Husband. Free. free. I say, I mean, I'll take him. If just you, for putting up with you. If you were a law abiding citizen, you you should be handing in people for free, not for money. 
Well, what? that mean, makes you as bad as them. But then you wouldn't get to go on flash holidays with your 20 20k pounds. would only get you it. No, wouldn't even Let's get you three days on holiday. 20k of taxpayer money. I couldn't because, as, as a staunch libertarian, morally, I couldn't take the 20,000 pounds of taxpayer money. God, how would boring. you? Who would you dob in then? No, I'd do the deal. I'd get 100k, and then I'd give <laughs> someone. You know. Would you on. give it to charity? Would you give it to, to, to mermaids or the no. environmentalism? I would. Did you just say mermaids? Yeah. No, you'd, you'd give, give it to Pride. I'd, 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 <laughs> I'd give it to Black Lives Matter. Okay, yes. I'd give thirty yes. grand to Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I, I'd give thirty, and grand, thirty grand to Stonewall. To Stonewall. Um, I'd spend thirty grand on lawyers to get the tax work clean. Oh, you got, you got. I got. Yeah, you did. You did. I don't like this game anymore. <laughs> I love I this like game. I like this. Yes. Right. What do I have to say now? Oh, it's fine. Okay. Carry on. Is it the Easy Jet? Oh, shush. Oh, my, my auto. <laughs> EasyJet staff have removed, God, have removed all its passengers of a flight to Ibiza following a huge row involving a heavily pregnant woman. She was allegedly branded abusive by an air hostess oh. before she... Well, everyone's abusive nowadays, aren't they? By an air hostess before she was ejected along with her family. All the passengers were made to leave the plane due to the situation. What's your nightmare holiday story? Here it is. Hey, Florence. Getting three off the plane the day. All right, well... Because of somebody thinking that they're better than everyone else? Yeah, because of this one person. This is going all over the internet. All over. Reem, are air staff, cabin crew, that's the word I was looking for, non-binary? Non-binary. Um, uh, are, they, are they getting better? Or worse? I think they're getting worse. And I, I've seen a few, a couple of these stories on the internet where people have been horribly treated for that reason. I think also sometimes passengers can be a little bit too sensitive. Actually, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'll go even further. I think everybody can be a little bit too sensitive these oh, days. Oh, hang on. She was being abused. Did you see the story about the guy that pooed all over the aeroplane because he had explosive diarrhoea? And then that, <laughs> the staff had to clean it up midair. Explosive diarrhoea in, over the entire well, flight. Right. Delta Air. Lines. Okay, sorry. I was just thanks for interrupting me with the yes. poo story. Really, poo really story. grateful. <laughs> you were finishing your point. So, well, I mean, I, I mean, I think Narinda's just sort of summarising right there. No, look, I think that you know people generally are a bit too sensitive. These kind of stories are quite horrible. Cabin crew are, tend to be, you know, tend to these days be a little bit more woke as well. I think <gasps> everyone's a bit too sensitive. Well, just because they don't, they will not put up with abuse. They not, they're not there to put I mean, up with abuse, Ray. The clocks hasn't, there hasn't the clock. <laughs> Oh, no. No, they did. Up next, it is Fox on the Spot. See you in trois. <laughs> Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs and Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my show, The Real World, every Friday at 7 p.m. I'm not eating bloody cat. Are you Delicious. Mental? Put your mouth. OK, here comes, a, <laughs> here comes a train. Reminds me of the scene in Singing in the Rain. Adam, is that a good one? Oh, whoa! Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomney, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. 
there will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Yek Shemesh, we are back, and I'm still with my panel. Reem, Ibrahim, and broadcast in Narinda Kaur. Right now, in a fairly significant false alarm, police officers attended a call to a class being held at a cafe in the north of England, mistakenly believing it to be the site of a mass murder. Was it? No. It was a yoga class. The person who raised the alarm has took the yogis for victims of a killing and therefore notified the police, who quickly arrived in large numbers. Is this the peak of human <laughs> intelligence? Narinda. I did my first yoga class four weeks ago and I thought it was horny housewives doing sex positions and it was in North London. I'm never going to be able to forget that. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was dirty. <laughs> I think yoga is fantastic, but clearly people are too stupid to understand what they're doing. I also think that police are incredibly incompetent. Are you trying to say that police get, that mistake, uh, you know, your honest policeman who mistakes a yoga class for a Because mother, they're all is, lying is there thick. and trying to be like woke, as you would say, and they've got candles lying on. Lying down it. isn't woke, Narinda. And they're sleeping. <laughs> Strange woman. woman. And Everything they're sleeping and they've got candles on. It's dark. It could look like a murder scene. I don't know which yoga lovely. class she goes yeah, to, but this I want one. to go. I love this one. Lying on the ground in yoga the dark. Yoga is fantastic. <laughs> it calms you down. They talk about, you know, your mental health and how good it is for your mental health, how good it is for your physical ability. It makes me angry. It's actually quite difficult. I think it's wonderful. I, but oh yoga God, is quite... Agree. It's sex I positions. Yoga. It's sex positions. Oh, why does no one agree on anything? <laughs> right now, I ask you to put me on the spot with any questions. It's on Fox on Spot. I'm so excited to see which one they've um, mm -hmm. pulled out tonight, or which one. OK, there we go. Ran, short for Randolph, asked, man bags, are they in or out this season? Speaking of in or out, do you have an in or an outy? Man bags, yeah, welcome to Funky Side. What's in? Man bags, what's out? Autism. <laughs> so, um, yes, I have an outy. I'm not going to show it. Yeah, well, no, I won't. They'll get in trouble. Anyway. Have you got an outy? Shush oh. now. <laughs> Samantha. <laughs> Uh, Samantha, but preferences Sam, preferences I can call her Sam, asks, oh. what's new pussycat? <laughs> I'm glad you added the cat. Uh, what's new pussycat? Well, I've got my new um, gender-affirming neck gyna from the, um, from the surgery. And um, <laughs> Leslie asks, if you're travelling in a car at the speed of light and you turn the lights on, does anything happen? Now, I would say, go and watch Oppenheimer. That'll tell you the answer. Um, Narinda, obviously, our chemistry is tight. Uh, Reem, if you should consider marrying, I'm willing to consider that myself. <laughs> but until that happens, I will see you next week. And thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. Thank you to my panel and to my guests and for you at home. Up next is the wonderful Mark Dolan. Mark, what have you got for us? Uh, Lawrence, you'd make a great daytime TV presenter. You've got a lovely, a lovely manner about you. Great to have you back in the studio. Now, my Mark Meets guest has a great bedside manner as well, and he's great in the kitchen too. It is TV chef, celebrity broadcaster, restaurateur, you name it, Anthony Worrell Thompson, talking about the highs and lows of life in the spotlight. Also, the Queen, a year, of course, since her sad passing. We'll be remembering her, in my big opinion, plus reaction from top royal broadcaster and best-selling author 
Tom Bauer. What does he think about King Charles? Has he got off to a good start? Has he had a first good year on the throne? Uh, also, is Boris Johnson right in breaking quotes uh, from his mail article in the next uh, 24 hours? Is he right that Britain will never rejoin the EU? What do you think? Mark at gbnews.com. Plus, in my take a 10, I'll be dealing with Holly and Phil from this morning there back in the news. Find out why after the weather. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. Evening, Alex Deacon here with your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. For most of us, the hot spell continues this weekend, but with an increasing chance of seeing some big thunderstorms. And eventually it will turn cooler into next week as this cold front approaches. But for the time being, we're between high pressure and low pressure and we still have the hot air in place, a balmy evening out there. One or two very isolated thundery showers across parts of the west, but the vast majority staying dry. We'll turn a little murky in places, a bit misty, particularly around the coasts uh, through the west. And it's going to be a very warm night as well. Temperatures holding up in towns and cities in the mid to high teens. Some spots may not drop below 20 Celsius. So a very warm start to what will be a hot Saturday. The main exception will be the far northwest where it will be distinctly cooler than today and as the day goes on there is an increasing chance of seeing some thunderstorms breaking out across the hearts of the country now if we see these downpours they could cause some problems there is a met office warning in place but they're going to be very hit and miss most places won't see them temperatures again getting into the 30s but as i said quite a bit cooler across the northwest of scotland where there will be more cloud and outbreaks of rain still a few thunderstorms rumbling on through the night and into sunday a greater chance of seeing more of these downpours parts of northern england north wales maybe into southern Scotland with a chance of thunderstorms but even further south we could import some from France. Again the majority won't see them and again for most another hot one. A brighter outlook with boxed solar. Proud sponsors of weather on GB News. What you get for breakfast is something that if we do our jobs right, you will wake up to news that you didn't know the night before. It's a conversation. It's not just me and Eamon. We want to get to know you and we want you to get to know us. From six, it's breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Monday to Thursdays on GB News. Britain's news channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we 